Amen. Well, as we continue in our study, and if you're new, we are studying Romans chapter 8. And as we continue Romans chapter 8, we're in verses 12, 13, and 14. And as you turn to verses 12, 13, and 14, Romans chapter 8, it is in consideration with these three verses that I also want to focus on another verse. The verse is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, and it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We need to pause and reflect upon just how big that verse is. It is a very, very big verse because it highlights the great and astonishing and marvelous theological truth that Christ in and through the person of the Holy Spirit living in us is in fact leading you and me in freedom. This is, in fact, the freedom that Christ announced in John chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus says, so if the Son, he's saying that in reference to him, himself, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. While we're at it, let's also not forget Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, that explicitly states, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Now, this draws us into a question. The question is basic, it's simple, it's how? How does his freedom, the freedom that you and I have with him in the indwelling Holy Spirit, how does, how does this work? Well, as we noted last week in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, in the reception of the Holy Spirit, that is to say, in receiving the Holy Spirit, you and I actually personally belong to Christ. Personally belonging to Christ means that Christ himself, through the Holy Spirit, has personally made you and me alive with him in his very resurrection life. In and through the Holy Spirit, Christ has personally breathed his life in each one of us. So we now live in him. In his gift of everlasting life, we live in him. In his gift of forever forgiveness, we live in him. In his very righteousness that has been imputed to our hearts and to our very lives by faith through grace. And you and I also so enjoy the sweetness, the comfort of his personal presence. Otherwise described as his eternal company. The company of Christ. Again, from the indwelling Holy Spirit. And if we happen to be students of the Bible, we will see as we study our Bibles that this has all been made available to us, all given to us by way of the cross. Because of Christ's perfect and complete work at the cross, where he paid the very price for our redemption, he paid the price with his very holy blood, where he also ended the rule and the reign of sin and death, our Lord, our resurrected Christ, the King of all kings, through the Holy Spirit, brings us into the power and the finality of his death blow to sin, which means sin and sin nature no longer owns you and me anymore. Because of Christ, in dwelling in us in the Holy Spirit, we get to walk 
in the freedom of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says and makes it very clear that those who are alive like this in Christ, in the Holy Spirit, we have truly been set free. Do you understand? You have been set free. You truly have been set free. We now live in the freedom of the Holy Spirit. And this is why Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, that when it comes to what we're all about in the body of Christ, what we're all about as belonging to Christ, we're all about being called to this freedom. Do you realize that? Your life with Christ is all about freedom. However, you and I who belong to Jesus Christ are not to allow our freedom to be an opportunity to indulge in what the Bible describes as our sin nature. Rather, we're to use this freedom that we have, that we've been given in Jesus, in the indwelling Holy Spirit, we're to use this freedom to do what? To love others, to serve others in love. So what this means is that you and I, in Christ, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, are set free to love. Think of that. We're set free to love. Now, as we move into Romans 8, verse 12, we are warned, we are admonished to steer clear of living according to our sin nature. And as we've noted, sin nature is the the, uh, proclivity, the propensity, the, the inclination that we have to live in sin that is our fallen nature and the fallenness and deadness of our human nature. That's what the Bible describes as sin nature. It's the way of sin. Every human being has this apart from Christ. Paul says in verse 12, therefore brothers, and I need to point out that that term brothers in our day and age, because so many times it's, people don't catch that, but brothers is an inclusive term in the Bible. It refers to male and female believers in the local church. So Paul says, therefore, brothers, is all included. We have an obligation, says Paul, but it is not to the flesh. Flesh is another way of describing this sin nature, our human nature that's fallen. He says, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sin nature to live according to it. Some of us think, okay. I hear that, but paint the picture for me. What what would it look like to live according to the sin nature? That's a good question. And the answer is found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. It's all right there. Answers that very question. Starting in verse 19, it says, The acts of the flesh also described as the deeds of the flesh, describing the same thing, it's our fallen nature. The acts of the flesh are obvious. In other words, they're clear. There's no mistaking these acts of the sin nature. First on the list is sexual immorality. And we realize today that sexual immorality is, in fact, a deed or an act of our sin nature. This is especially relevant for us today in our culture, in our world, which can be adequately described as utterly consumed with sex. It's all consumed with sex everywhere you go. You can't watch TV without having that appeal. You can't be on social media without having that appeal. I have to say that our culture and our world right now is hell-bent, and I use those words, is absolutely hell-bent on asserting that any and all forms, all sexual relations are to be accepted and supported and even endorsed, applauded. And shame on you if you don't endorse all forms of quote-unquote freedom, sexual relations. 
But I think what we have to ask is, what does God have to say about it? Okay, I know what the world is saying about it. I, I know what my culture is saying about it. But what does God himself have to say about this in his word? How, how does the Bible define sexual immorality? And this is, get, again, where it gets super simple. Because the way that God defines sexual immorality in his word is this. Any and all forms of sex outside of the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman is immoral. That's it. Sin, it is evil in the eyes, the eternal eyes of Almighty God, Holy God. Why? Because it's never been his will except for what was just defined. Sex is an incredible blessing from God. <laughs> Amen. And the way that God has designed that blessing and freedom and the best sex is between a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage. Everything outside of that would be what God describes here as immoral. You say, well, what are some examples of all that is? Well, we, we'd have to include adultery, right? So what is adultery? Adultery is sex with, sex with somebody else's spouse. That's adultery. What about fornication? Well, fornication is premarital sex. That's included. What about homosexual sex? Yes, that, that's included. It's men with men or women with women. And while we're at it, we could talk about bestiality. What's bestiality? Well, that's people having sex with animals. And really, we could plumb the line of all the perversions that are out there and in place in terms of sexual relations, but we're not going to do that because, again, we realize what's already been stated. All forms of sexual relations outside of male and female in the covenant of marriage are what God deems as, as immoral. I'll, I'll put it like this. God has so much better for us in the wholeness and the commitment and the covenant that he blesses in marriage. But again, sexual immorality is a deed or an act of the sin nature. It's wicked in the eyes of a holy God. Which is why, as we move along the list here, uh, continuing in verse 19, uh, we also see impurity and then debauchery. And these are related to sexual immorality. Debauchery is, is the excessive indulgence of sensual pleasures. And so that's what it is. And then we move to verse 20 and it says idolatry. And do we realize that idolatry, which is the worship of anything or anyone other than God, that idolatry is actually an act or deed of our sin nature. And then right after that, we see sorcery. And this is the use of the occult or the use of witchcraft to obtain personal desire and personal pleasure at any and all costs. It is entirely self-seeking to the point where, where you can also look at this as a form of self-worship when somebody practices the occult. Because it's all about them. But the list isn't done. It continues, verse 20, hatred, discord, jealousy, and rage, rivalries, divisions, factions. And you know what this includes? This actually includes slander and gossip. And so many people don't realize that gossip, you think it's all friendly. Well, God says, no, it's not. It's disaster. It's acid. For, for an individual to be operating in gossip or slander, that is an acting out of their sin nature. It's all included right there. Verse 21, it continues. It says, an envy, drunkenness, orgies, and these three words, and the like, meaning there is more that is not necessarily mentioned here that can and should be included. I think it's significant that the great theologian J.I. Packer said he believes that pride itself is the taproot of the sin nature. I think he's right, because we can put pride right in there. Arrogance, it's the taproot through which it all flows. And this list comes with this 
warning, he says, I warn you as I did before that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, you're not in it. Paul, with that, that, those three other words, practice such things, is referring to a lifestyle in the sin nature. A lifestyle headlong given to pleasing me, all about me, and whatever my sin desires might be. I'm following through with that, and I live like that. That's how I live my life. I want you to realize that Paul is not describing a Christian who struggles. We're a Christian who has sinned. We all have. That's why we're here, turning to the Lord. But that's not what Paul is describing. Not inherit the kingdom of God, meaning you were never of it. If you live in that way, if you go in that way, this only confirms the fact that you are not in it. If we have, and this is true for us as a body, but it's true for us just in our life with the Lord, if, if somebody comes into our life and they're claiming to know Jesus Christ, they're claiming perhaps even to, to be indwelt by the Spirit, they claim to be a Christian, whatever it is they say that they are, yet their lifestyle, as we see it, and Paul says it's completely obvious, right? As we see these individuals who would make such a claim like that, but they are totally lost headlong in sexual immorality, whatever it is, idolatry, whatever it is, it's in that list. We have every right to ask, does that person personally know Jesus Christ? Do they know him? So why? I tell you why we have the right to ask that question. Because Christ himself frees us from living in this sin, sin nature, death, enslavement kind of lifestyle. That is the, the prison cell that we used to live in apart from Christ. We recognize together that there's not life in that. It's death. And this helps us to understand as we continue in Romans chapter 8, we go to verse 13. Paul says, if you live according to the flesh, what is the next words? You will die. Flesh being sin nature. In other words, you know where that lifestyle is going to take you. You've been there. You, you've lived like that. You've lived apart from Christ. You know that gutter all too well. You know that misery all too well. You know that enslavement all too well when you lived among the living dead, gratifying the desires of sin and sin nature. And where that leads, again, is death. The Bible is whispering to us, don't go there. Don't go back there. Don't turn, live in that way. Why? Because you, believer in Jesus Christ, with his very Holy Spirit living in you, you have been called to freedom. Freedom from being enslaved to sin and sin nature. Look at the next part of verse 13. This is our life. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, that's another way of describing the sin nature. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will what? You will live. Which means you'll enjoy this freedom that God has put you in, in Christ indwelt by the Spirit. Notice, it says, it's by the Spirit. By the Spirit. Notice, it's not by Jim Peterson's religious works or religious efforts. Notice, it is by the Spirit that we put to death the deeds of the body, sin nature. How, how do we, by the Spirit, put to death our sin nature? Now, that very question takes us to the truth about the Holy Spirit. That is just absolutely staggering, so utterly amazing, so beyond, so astonishing, so incomparable, so wonderful. 
You want to know what that truth is? God, the Holy Spirit, personally applies the power of the death of Christ to my sin nature. My words, he zaps it in the power of the cross. That's what he does. And as this happens, as we walk with the Holy Spirit in his life, he helps us to live in his freedom, free from the constraints, free from the control, free from the slavery of sin and death at work within my sin nature. In other words, I am now free in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I'm free by the Holy Spirit to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And you know what people see when I'm bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, it's rather it's the Spirit in me bearing that fruit. But what do people see when they see that kind of stuff, that fruit in my life? I'll tell you what they see. They see Jesus Christ. They see Jesus. Wow, man, that guy, he looks like Jesus. He's just so full of peace. He's so full of joy. He's so full of life. He showed that kind of patience. How could he do that? Because of Christ, power and presence of the Spirit. Now, I, I think it would be good for us to illustrate just a little bit more in how this actually happens, how it is that the Holy Spirit personally applies the power of the death of Jesus Christ to my sin nature, how he zaps it. And for that, I think we go back into our childhood. We think about childhood, at least I do. I think about being a kid, and what I did as a kid is I find myself outside climbing trees, getting dirty, getting, doing, you know, chasing after, grabbing snakes. I mean, doing all this kind of stuff. As a kid, I did that. I got very dirty. I cut myself all the time, and when I cut myself, I went crying to mama, as you did too. And as I cried to Mama, I came in, and Mama took me over to the sink. And if Mama needed to, she would look at that cut, and she'd see, you know what, that cut there, Jimmy, it it's, it's, could get infected because there's so much, there's moss in there. You know, she finds stuff. There's all the stuff in there. we got to clean that out. So the first thing she would do is clean it out, but then here's what else she would do. She would take this polysporin stuff. She would dab it on a Q-tip or a cotton. And then she would dab it on the cut, apply it to that cut. This is the way that we illustrate how it is the Holy Spirit applies the work of the cross, the power of the death of Jesus Christ, his resurrection life to you and me personally. He does it just like that in, in, a, in a way of thinking of the Holy Spirit. He is the divine Q-tip. He's the divine Q-tip that personally applies the blood of Christ, the death of Christ, the victory of Christ to me, making it oh so real because it is real and true. Now there's a hitch. Here's the hitch. We know just that the reality that as a kid, when mom was taking that Q-tip with polysporin, or that cotton to, to move in upon that cut, I could jerk away. I, I could turn away. I could say, no, no, Mom. See, the reality is, in the way that the Holy Spirit applies the very work of Jesus Christ to you and me, listen to this, the Holy Spirit will never, I use this word, never force it upon us. I'm serious. Ever. He will never force it. So how, well then how, the Holy, how does he do it? How does the Holy Spirit apply all that Christ has given to me at the cross and his power and resurrection? I tell you how he applies. He leads you in this. The fact that he leads us in this means that you and I have say in the matter. We can, we can do the Heisman. We can, we can say, no more. We can. If we're headlong and stuck and we want to live in the sin nature, we say, no. The Holy Spirit will never force us into this, ever. It's who God is. In fact, look at verse 14. 
for all who are led by the Spirit of God. Notice it doesn't say for all who are forced by the Spirit of God or the sons and daughters of God. It's not what it says. All who are led by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, are the sons and daughters of God. See, this is so pivotal for you and for me because what this comes down to for you and me in Christ, knowing Christ, walking with Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, is simply you and me saying yes to God. Yes, Lord. I submit to you. I surrender to you. Have your lead in my life. We've all heard that, that, you know, that statement years ago it came out, let go and let God. And, and that statement you know, so, so many times doesn't apply to anything, but this is, this, that statement really does apply here. That's exactly what it's meant. It is you and me letting go and letting God the Holy Spirit lead us. If we're yielded to Christ, if we're yielded to the Holy Spirit, he's going to zap the sin nature in me and cause me, listen, to live above the sin nature, by his victory. That's the promise. So many, many, many years ago, I'm saying that because my kids, my daughter's married, they're all grown up. But many, many years ago, I remember we, we lived in Canada, pastored a church up in Manitoba, Canada. And as it turned out, we had this vacation time, or I had this vacation time, and Steffi, she had to work. And so, but we had these kids, and the kids are kind of at this age where they could be rebels, they could be, they can kind of stick their heels in if they wanted to and really put up a fight. That's, you know, they're at that age, but at the same time, they're, they're also at that age where they potentially could be led. And so we made this decision together. We thought, okay, all right, Steffi's got to work, but I don't. And so, kids, here's what we're going to do. Dad is going to take you from Canada all the way into South Dakota. You're going to go to Mount Rushmore, and then you're going to head on over to Grandma and Grandpa's. And the thing about this one trip is the three of us will get together, and even now, Ingrid and my son Jimbo and, and me will we'll talk about that experience. We, we did that with our little black doggie. I mentioned last week the same black doggie was with us on, on, on that trip. But what was so amazing about that trip and I'll say this just, in the, in the, just as a dad. It was just a how all in they were with me in this. In other words, they knew where we were going. They knew that we're, what was, was going to happen is going to be good. We're going to stay in hotels. We're going to eat out. And, and we're going to go ultimately to see this Mount Rushmore. And we're going to have this journey together all along the way. We're going to end up at Grandma and Grandpa's, and it's going to be fantastic. The kids are thinking that, and I am thinking that. Why? Because I am the one leading us there. But they're all in. And so, wow, it was so many hours. This is a huge drive for these younger kids. They were, just had a blast. I got in such severe trouble because I, I go, yeah, kids, you want Red Bull? Sure, sure go ahead. Eat, take, take as much Red Bull as you want. And Steffi sees this picture. We sent her back this picture of the kids drinking Red Bull on the top of our... <laughs> She's all, Dad, this can't be happening. Kids should not be... <laughs> the point is, they had so much fun because they knew their dad and all of us together, we're going someplace really cool, really great, really wonderful. The whole thing was a total gas. I bring this up because I believe this is a great description. It's a great illustration of where the Holy Spirit wants to take us in the victory of Jesus Christ. He's got us in the car, and we're not to kick and scream, but we're to have fun with him. We're to enjoy him. Say, yes, Lord, take me there. Live in this freedom that we have in the Holy Spirit. Explore that. Check it out. Enjoy His presence.